Like you start to get to know what an um looks like. Oh, really? Um, oh, yeah. What does it look like? Describe it. Um, it kind of looks like a dead fish, or usually it it's, depends on the person. Oh. The person. I mean, as you're editing, you start to recognize these shapes. Right. As you see a space and then a, a, a fish. And then this, yeah. Ah. It's um. Interesting. So if you see the shape of a fish, do you think of the word um? Like, do, do you pattern match like that? As I'm all? editing, yeah, totally. Yeah. Huh. If that's what I, if I'm looking to, to buy time or if someone's an excessive ummer, you don't want to take them all out because that's part of people's speech, right? Oh, sure. Right. But, um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you're looking to trim something up, but anyway. Yeah. That's a whole other show. No, it's on. not. It's this not. is part of the show. <laughs> it is. It's now part of the show because yeah. that's what it is. Are we on? Are we rolling? We're rolling. Okay. Hi, so I am Erica Hunsinger. I'm an artist and an assistant librarian here at Mead Public Library in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. I My coworker is John Tully, and he will be our first guest for our first show on In the Act. Welcome, John. Thanks, Erica. It's really great to be here. It's good to see your face <laughs> from across the, the distance. But Right. Um, Basically, I think this program is important to demystify the act of creativity, to demystify the act of making. Uh, what does it look like for each different person? Uh, how you dress in the morning, how you plate your food, how you create your garden, what, where do you go on your walk, how you, what, you used a digger um, to, uh, to move dirt around and to lift things up. What is your craft? What do you make? And so everybody makes, and the act of making is healthy. The act of making is psychologically and human for humans, an important part of, of staying and being healthy. And so everyone has this creativity and this making person inside of them in whatever form and however it translates or however it's transformed. So we're just talking about that. That's our, that's our focus. And so we'll be talking with artists, uh, a lot of artists, but also people who don't consider themselves artists and what do they do and what do we do? It's interesting as you introduce the concept of the show, what spoke to me was this idea and what you, I'm sure you hear this often is, is it's overcoming can't. I can't. Right. right. Something that has been sometimes planted in us, this idea that we can't do something right how to overcome that and um how important it is to overcome that in the process that that's just something i thought of right away and and um so yeah how you know we can yes we can and we all do yeah and i think that i don't know where it was instilled along the line that there's a measure uh, that you have to be in order to feel like you can. Mm. Mm-hmm. And what I think it's lost along the way is play mm-hmm. and the importance of play because within the act of playing, whatever it is, if you're goofing around with friends or if you're on the beach and dragging your hand through the sand or if you're throwing stones in the water, I don't know, those are my first thoughts Mm -hmm. but that sort of impulsive what does your body want to do how does your mind just kind of let go a little bit those are things that we can do that I think really uh inform or help to um I'm not sure help to grow the other pieces inside that we can do they're, they might be really small, but they're really important. And so I think that cans might just come from experimentation and play. And then it doesn't feel as unattainable. And 
disconnected. And I think that's, uh, for so many people, that's where the can't comes from. Like you can't draw, I hear, I can't even draw a stick figure. Mm -hmm. That's a, a relatively common phrase that I hear from people. And it's like, well, okay, I don't know if I really like my stick figures either. I'm a trained artist, but that's not what's important to me. Uh, I know how to draw some things, but that's not what's important to me. And I think that that's where we kind of get caught up is what's important to you might not be on a scale of what's important to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. And you can still make things. And I think a lot of times that can't, I, I can barely draw a stick figure or a lot of those things come from some source when we're small. Sure. And so does, you know, it's almost like going back before that was planted. When we could, anything was possible. And that's something we were just talking about being down at the lake and uh, to get small. Um, I was walking along the beach the other day and, and I'm assuming it was a kid because it was small, right? right? And there was these little sticks planted in the sand, really tiny. And I got down with it and, and, and took these pictures and made it larger than it was. Wow. I just got small with it. And that's the beauty of, you know, the modern age with these cameras and our phones and everything and, and being able to take quality pictures. But it was, um, it's been a, a real source of my inspiration is that idea of getting small again. Interesting. And getting back to, and um, growing up, uh, my mother was a stay-at-home mom and a crafter. And so we had our cupboard of craft stuff and she went through her macrame phase and she went through the holly hobby phase where you cut out the little figures and stack them so they're awesome. 3D yeah. and all this stuff. <laughs> and it was, I mean, it was kind of, you know, it was trash, it was busy work. Sure. And, um, but I recognize that that's where a lot of, that's where I found joy. It's where I found, um, you know, I was able to kind of just reside inside myself in yeah. a way that, and, uh, and, 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 and stay in this dream place. And then my, my inspiration that I often go back to, I got into painting, uh, I've been painting all my life, but I really got into painting, doing canvases and art. And I thought about my own daughter at three years old, at a time before she started um, controlling line and drawing little figures that float in space where she would just fill the page with just, I just, just feed her paint and she would just fill it. And, you know, I was sitting around with a blank canvas on the easel thinking about that. I can't for some stupid reason. Yeah. And I think, I often think about her, if I'm not finding anything inspiring, I'm just like, well, fill the, fill the canvas. Fill sure. It. Why not? Something will come of that. Right. Um, I don't. I often feel that I should learn to control line more or that should, should, should. But my joy is really in abstraction and really in filling the canvas and letting what comes come by, by not being restricted by anything. Yeah. By not overthinking things. But I often, um, that one moment, and it was really one in particular of her filling the the page and it was just mucky brown colors because she just didn't care just mashing it in right it's like earth tones you know and just the joy and then she was filled it up and hopped off her stool and went on her way to do something else you know it was also <laughs> a time when she was lining up her little thing you know this this amazing freedom in that and i i often think of that and i often let her know that she's the the you know three decades later she's still a huge inspiration that moment wow yeah and um so there's times where if I'm up against something, I'm like, well, fill the fill it. If you don't know what to do, just fill it. Fill the fill the negative space, and which is kind of interesting to think of Kant as a negative, to fill the negative space. Sure. For me, right. I also recognize that there's times where it's important to have the balance of negative space. Right. Right. So, um, so the beach and the lake as a place in these troubled times to go where it's always there and it will be forever. Um, to some extent, it's this power, it's this force that uh, demands you to slow down and pay attention or demands some attention. 
right. to, to, to maybe get out of your phone and, and even granted I'm taking pictures of my phone, but um, I'm engaging and there's gifts and there's so much information there. Even before I started going down there heavily again this spring, I was painting all these landscapes and these waves and now I'm seeing these pictures and I'm seeing how they relate that, you know, the more I observe, the more it's coming back out of me again. And it's been really uh, validating, I guess. This The more you observe, the more it comes out of you. Is that what you said? Well, like I'm absorbing. Like I, I recognize right. through seeing these photos, I'm seeing these paintings I'd done three months before, the way the light travels. Gotcha. Especially, I was thinking about this last night, you know. Yeah. If you think of a sunset, you think of looking to the west. Well, this is, we're fa- I'm facing east, and there's this incredible diffusion of light as that last and 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 color that is so unlike looking into the intensity of a sunset to see the opposite side of it because there's nothing in the way it's just receiving that the final light across the distance of the lake and there's these incredible lavenders and muted roses and and then it's reflecting off the water on the sand and off the you know, I mean the same is true the sunrise but there's a difference in intensity Right. Wow. What a beautiful, I've never heard a sunset on the, like talking about a sunset on the opposite side because the, you know, because we're on the lake, we, the the Michigan side of, uh, of the lake is the sunset side and the Wisconsin side of the, of Lake Michigan is the, is the sunrise side. But I hadn't heard anybody talk about the sunset, um, from its muted perspective on the opposite end on the East side, Um, over the lake and the lake yeah your photos when you were talking about that somebody had set up those little sticks Mm -hmm. and that you had gotten down to their eye level and to see through their lens in a way and um yeah hearing you and seeing the photos that you take about the the lake and having that be such an inspiration and Mm -hmm. that traveling into your work uh, yeah, and it almost it's it's interesting because it's almost like after the fact. So it makes it makes the the actual process of the painting almost like I was in a dream, or you know that it, that oh. that just by go, you know granted I'd gone down there a lot, but I hadn't really started taking photos. Um, I mean, I kind of took a break from painting, and so suddenly to kind of see that it's coming through, it was just val- it was just an incredible validation for everything I'd been doing of. Uh, uh, and these reverse gradations that are happening on these different levels where the, the, with the light source and the way that uh, it's hard to describe as I'm waving my hands around, but um, sure. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, when we had talked before, um, mm-hmm. at one point you had talked about the horizon line being sort of a, um, almost the balance between the, the earth and sky, but that it's a, that you can flip your paintings then. The, the horizon line was so important within your paintings, um, view like as if you're viewing the lake, but that they could they could be flipped, that well, they could uh, be either sky or, or lake. Right. Yeah, the interesting relationship between not only light but color and, and the reflective nature of water, right? And so and and the rhythm of the waves repeating itself within the sky, not only just in like the, the, the white caps and the, and the difference in color of rolling, but also there's some angles that start happening sure. um, as they're coming into the shore. And uh, so there's both, you know, a rhythmic and texture. And yeah, for a while I was painting these horizon lines and I often will flip a painting over anyway. And, and the horizon, the, the sort of idea of these, um, these sort of lake, views was just a way to get out of really busy, busy abstract work. It was calming during this pandemic to uh, just have a, a, a balanced line to work with as one line and oh, everything gosh, else yeah. was soft and movement. And so, um, and I was playing with glazes, so there's a buildup of color. Um, but the the gradients, um, yeah, there's just, there's a lot of really subtle things at play. And um, the more I spend time actually not only looking at the lake, but even taking photos, because often I'm taking photos from really close to the, I'm not really seeing the brilliance of it because I'm in the moment of I'm waiting for a wave to crash or I'm, 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 because I'm small, I'm not getting the big picture until I get home and start editing them. And I go, oh my God, look at the way the sky is reflecting off that, that uh, water on the sand as as the wave comes in. Yeah. Because I'm not, I just can't get small, small enough. Uh, in fr- as far as seeing with the camera, I have to trust the camera to grab that. 
for me. I'm reaching down with the camera. I'm, I'm grabbing these images. So as I go home, all of a sudden I see the full splendor of what I've just witnessed, you know, even wow. though. Wow. So, yeah. Because I'm uh, la- last night I was down. I go down almost every day, but I was down and seeing, uh, I was trying to anticipate because really what I love is the crash uh, of the wave creates this little parade of joy or, you know, this procession of joy. Is yeah. I, you know, there's this little party, there's a little dance party. And sometimes it get, or it can just have, it's just amazing to capture this moment of, of the character of the lake. Yeah. And, uh, I find it. Or, or the stillness, if, you know, as it's come in, also there's this, this stillness. And like you were saying a moment ago of the ability to, like, sometimes you can't, depending on the fog or whatever, it's hard to even know where the horizon line is. Sure. And other times you could literally take that image and flip it over. Right. And which way is up. Right. You know. Which is probably a <laughs> pretty interesting way of how we have may have felt a lot this year as well. Yeah. Which way? What day is it? You know? <laughs> right. Yeah. So. Well, that's so interesting to think about um, your observations of the lake that you try and get there daily, that that's a pattern for you and a source of not only inspiration for your work, but it sounds like it's also calming mm. and uh, feeds you in in other ways as well. And the idea, I'm not sure I fully grasp the idea of getting small. Um, so I don't know if we can maybe talk about that a, a little bit more. Well, I think it's interesting because here, you know, you're working on the third floor in the kids department. right. And um, I think the kids don't seem as phased by all this as we are as adults. And and it's interesting that in this time of solitude, I'd go to this place of intense solitude, the lake. Sure. To um, kind of reground myself. I see. Through the sound. Uh, it's surprising how few people there are down at the lake on the beach. It is. And... Um, in this high tech world with our, especially with our phones. I mean, I remember going down in the summertime of pre pandemic and you look around, everybody's on their phone at the beach, you know, right. it's like, wow, what are you doing? You know? And there I am on my phone taking pictures. Right. So, right. You know, I mean, I don't want to be a hypocrite, but, uh, you know, there's something that just embraces you about the sound, the, um, the mist in the air on certain nights. Um, uh, I just, the, the physical act of getting there, you know, mm-hmm. we're luckily to live nearby that we can walk or ride a bike. Sure. So both getting there and getting back gets my little 20 minute exercise in. Right. And um, I just always feel so much better coming back. Right. Often with sand in my shoes or wet toes or um, some interesting little gift that the lake's given me that I, you know, find washed up. Or one day I went down and there's cigarette butts everywhere. I picked those up. So, you know, I try oh, yeah, and give back that. too by, yeah. by uh, helping whatever I can, but I didn't mean to be talking so much about the lake, but it's certainly been the, the big source for me lately. Well, um, and it's a huge, I mean, it, it is a, nature is the ultimate act of creativity, right? right? So right. have you been down to the lake when it looks exactly the same or right. the colors yeah. are the right. same or right. the, the wave pattern is the same or, you know, and how do you, it just sounds like there's so much to draw from within that yeah. personally and within your within your work. Right. Uh, right. And then trying to grasp that essence, that those wholeness, those whole pieces that seem to just fill you up when you're down at the lake. Mm-hmm. How do you bring that back? How do you, you know, and I think that for me, photography is like that. Is like I'm trying to capture that essence in some way of like holding on to those moments or reminding me of those moments, almost like when, you know, thinking back for you with your, with your daughter and her painting and filling up the page, you know, it's like coming back to those moments that give us those joyful or just make such an impression in your, in your core that you can relive it a tiny bit and may help give uh, some measure of peace within those mm. times or mm-hmm. I mean that's that maybe that's a little bit more of what I'm getting but it sounded like joy was one of the things that you were talking about within that 
Well, and I think that's the huge part of, I mean, think about the being a kid before you're being told things you can't do. You know, think of the joy you find in, a, in, a, in the grass and in the worms and, and just getting small or, or um, right. sand. I mean, uh, you know, I was born in Sturgeon Bay, so I spent my early days, and it didn't occur to me until I'd already been back here in Sheboygan for uh, a couple months, and I was driving north and saw the exit for Sturgeon Bay. And I was like, oh, gosh, I've come full circle, haven't I? Awesome. <laughs> All right. Let's take a break. And we'll be back with John Tully on In the Act. Hi, welcome back. This is Erica on In the Act with John Tully, our uh, uh, one of our other resident artists in building in the building at Mead Public Library. So, welcome back, John. Thanks. Good to be here. Yay! Uh, one of the things we were just talking about is that the absence, almost the absence of talking about art in the last segment talking, I mean, not the absence of, I guess, but, uh, what things stick out when we talk about creativity and what's inspiring and what rises to the surface when we're talking about these things. And the fact that you're talking about this act of daily practice, going down to the lake to be, um, to be with the lake and to become small and to feel that profundity in its different stages and ways and then how it's how it influences your work and your and your and your own self your own body your mind um but to focus mostly on the lake is really funny mm-hmm. right? it's great well it's interesting cuz you know uh, i I've, I've taken fr- I started rearranging my house, which is how I clean. And part of that process, I, I I was feeling the urge to actually get sloppier in my painting. I have a theater background in which often we're, um, you're using much more fluidity, you're spraying, you're laying things down. I just was like, I feel like I need to get looser, you know, because I've been like using a brush and getting very, and everything. Sure. <clears throat> And um, so I packed up my studio, and I was going to move it to the basement, and I just haven't gotten around to – I just decided to take a break, and I'm going to try and, like, do that extra 5% and finish things so that they're ready to hang. And what does that mean, an extra 5% finished well, so they're like, ready I to hang? Well, like, I haven't, like – you know, I have – this is a whole other topic, but there's things Maybe that, not. Like, I've been wrapping <laughs> – maybe not. I've been wrapping the color – I've been wrapping my paintings around the edges, right? And – what does that mean? I'm sorry. You've been wrapping your paintings around the edges. So the edge of your paintings, you're painting? Yes. Okay. Yes. And and I've been doing this on, off and on. I had a visit from a, a Manhattan art dealer. He was a brother of a, a dear friend of mine who was very instrumental in getting me painting early on. So I'm living in some hodunk town in southwestern Wisconsin. And, and um, his brother came through. And I had the opportunity to show him my work. And this is, he's, he was a high-end Manhattan. He was the owner of the oldest uh, gallery uh, uh, dealership in New York. And he unfortunately passed away through with, from COVID. Um, I'm so sorry so it was to a real that. loss. But I think about him all the time as I'm painting. Because one of the things he looked at was not so much as looked at the paintings, but he looked at the edges and the backside. Like, how is this constructed? And I did the same huh. thing when I first saw your work. I mean, it's something I look for. It's like, I'm, I'm yeah. like, what is it that makes this art with a capital A sure. <laughs> as opposed to a painting, you know? Sure. And okay. often it's like, how is it being presented? And, right. And, and so, um, you know, I'm, I'm, it's, I'm self-taught in terms of like it's an accumulation of life experiences that, uh, you know, I do what I do. Uh, it, it came to the 
overcoming the can't part of I can't was realizing that I've had a brush in my hands for most of my life. Whether it's painting a house, painting, painting, painting. I've been applying paint to surfaces most of my life. Interesting. Right? Um uh, and this is another story that, along with the daughter painting. Yeah, do it. Was, was, um, I used to edit an astrology show on <laughs> WDRT, and my astrologer... It's awesome. Where uh, was that? Out in Viroqua, Wisconsin. Okay. And um, so I get these free readings, and he he's brilliant astrologer, Ryan Evans. Um, he's out on the West Coast now. But one of his readings for me was, was um, you know, you must learn to draw your sword. He did this whole past lives, and he's just basing it based on the stars and on my charts and everything. Was that I had been repressed in my previous life, right? You know, I'm afraid to to draw my sword. You must learn to draw your sword. Go find a teacher to teach you to draw your sword. And there was a, a really um, dear friend of mine who's um, works in the Bujin Khan, which is a nin- the ninja arts. And she would teach. Uh, Can you repeat sh- that word again? Bujin Khan. Bujin Khan. I K A N. Okay. They practice in Green Bay. It's it's a it's an ongoing uh, it's a old Japanese martial art that is um, very fluid in nature. It's it's different from karate or um, jujitsu or some of these things that are or a lot of a lot of these um, Korean based or military based arts that are based on very specific patterns. And the Bujin Khan is much more f- fluid in that. You're really training yourself to, first of all, move. You learn how to take the blows. You learn how to receive as well as, you know, and and um, it, she, I, I went and took classes for about two and a half years with her. In, uh, wow. Part of that art was um, because often in Japan you're dealing with uh, the samurai and the sword work, so you need to also learn how to draw your sword. So we literally, I spent some time with her one-on-one learning to draw a, a, a literal sword, right? Wow. And it took me, it was a couple of years later where I, I kind of came to that realization. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Fisher King, but you know, uh, the, the story. The movie? Of, yeah. The, yeah, okay. The story of the Fisher King of like, how could you find what my wisest men couldn't find? And, and, and the fool said, I don't know. I just knew you were thirsty. You know, that, right. that there was in his hand was the goblet. And I had that realization that the sword has always been in my hand in the form of this brush. Oh wow! And um, all all this time, because of, because I'd separated house painting from canvas painting and theater painting, and blah, right? Blah, 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 blah. Right. It's all the same. It's right? all the same. It's all right. the same. So, um, so it, ironically, <laughs> to have this uh, astrologer, and I'm sure you know, there's various. You know, you must prepare to climb the mountain. There's always some kind of thing. Sure. Um, you have to go through the brambles to get to the top, and uh, learn to draw your sword. You know. Use the force loop, you know, <laughs> right? And sure. um, so, <laughs> right. you know, so literally here's this opportunity to take this class and, and learn how to literally draw a sword and, um, and, and uh, learn to take, take the punches and roll with the punches. And, and, um, but what a profound thing to, to, to realize that your sword is your paintbrush. Right. Like to have the, this all just sort of, yeah. come together yeah. in this yeah it was profound because it, it well and it does it comes back to that which you seek is right in front of you right the answers you seek are you you, you just need to be open to that and i think i get that back to the lake you know often there there are answers right there if you're willing to be open to them right wow. or yeah. or the lake can receive your troubles sure uh yeah. Uh, and that's really, you know, going down there, it's just, uh, yeah, it's just, it really is. It's like, talk about getting small, because, man, <laughs> that's a big lake. That's you know? a big lake. Yeah. And um, that was, that was, uh, that was a, a really great moment um, in getting over any sense of can't, you know, any, any, and that's just, I think that there's, uh, I think it was just, yeah, that was really key. It was really, really a, a, an aha for me, you know? So, um, so in the process of, uh, 
I think the, 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 the coming down to this point of recognizing the calm and the joy, and I think this comes back to what you were just talking about earlier, is like that same thing of going to the lake and getting small is not much difference than getting into my head with a painting, oh. getting lost in the creative process, right? Sure. I mean, my mom macrameing. Right. It's busy work, right? You're, 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 and, and it enables you uh, an avenue to be free to think or not or, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, there's, because you're actively, your squirrel mind is busy doing something. Right, that you know, repetitive. Pack of nuts or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And, and, and sure. it just it just gives you, it's, it's meditative, there's prayer meditative. involved. Sure. Right? Um, so there's a lot of parallels. So even though I'm not actively painting right now, I'm actively creating by by getting small and 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 finding that joy by going being sure I get down to the lake, you know, for example. Absolutely. Or, right. Yeah. So watching the birds recently I was at a friend's house and we were just like and there was, <laughs> there was a squirrel that has has no tail and we're like, "Oh, it wants, it wants to be a bunny." <laughs> you know. <laughs> He's transitioning into a rabbit. It was really neat to see, you know, but he no longer had that propeller anymore wow. and was overcoming it or, or um the goldfinches and they're bickering all the time and just all this yeah it was just amazing so there's so many sources of um just reminders to slow down if we look for them right yeah and i think that that you know the spring is my favorite season anyway but it spring is so creative everything is just everything starting to once was that seemingly looked dead or unalive or <laughs> non-dynamic whatever you want to use with that is starting to grow and sprout and the ground is changing colors and the leaves uh, you know are starting to open up differently and uh, everything looks different and so that and I think that paralleling that with what we're experiencing right now within the pandemic, things are starting, you know, almost half of our people are inoculated and um, we're having, a, you know, a, a little bit easier time than getting together with family and close friends. Mm-hmm. It's safe to do so. And there's that, I think, sort of parallel experience of, of that sort of opening up and that blooming and that reconnecting. Uh, to nature even too and so hearing you talk about being with a friend even and watching birds is like oh my gosh did you see a person in person yeah and you got to experience and watch uh life around you which is also this you know really creative creative experience yeah yeah and and in silence at times you know to be with another person and not have to fill it with blather you know just right. to take things in and um i have a hard time with that <laughs> yeah well yeah exactly right well and i've just like here we you see the seagulls um all the nest building you know and and uh certainly as we've been like holed up in our nests um uh, right. that was part of my whole thing of like rearranging the house is just so i don't go nuts you know climbing the walls right is to kind of like out with the old and and um or or um you know, picking up old bits and making something new of it. Or, or right. uh, I actually pulled out some big paint brushes and painted some walls in my house, which I haven't really done much of, but um, it just resets the space, you know. Can you tell a little bit about that? Yeah. Because it seems like that's just, you know, you packed up your studio and it's in the basement, but then well, you just transferred, you know, what is considered quote unquote fine art, right? Into the basement and boxes, but now you're, you're, it's all the same attitude, right? You're right. creating right. in your Actually, if dwelling. I'm glad you brought that up because what I did, what I'm creating in my dwelling is um, I'm actually undoing previous remodel jobs that maybe weren't quite up to snuff. Interesting. Now, I am a person that's done my share of hack remodel jobs, so I'm certainly <laughs> not like talking like I know... <laughs> you know, rah, rah, rah. sure. Yeah. But I recognize that the previous owner um, had done these over the 13 years or so that they were there. Had done some upgrades. That's our local fire engine <laughs> station. Oh, I, keeping yeah, our place safe. 
All right. Where were we, we were, oh yeah, okay, the remodel thing. Sorry. No, yep. no, no, it's okay. Um, yeah, so your dwelling. So I, you're... I, live in a, I live in a cream brick house. Oh, um, is it a cream city brick? I would guess. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's a very special. Well, I grew up in Watertown. Brick. It also had Watertown, Wisconsin, as a source of cream brick too. Oh, there okay. Quarries, and so I wasn't sure if this was like Cream City from Milwaukee bricks, yep. or if this is just something to do with the lakefront. No, so I think these it... buildings here are are Milwaukee brick. I, I, I believe wasn't so. Sure, that would make sense. But we're looking out the windows at them. I'll have to um, ask my friend Gregory. <laughs> I think it started. What did I do first? I had some projects. I had built a, a third, uh, I built a wall upstairs to create a third bedroom. Um, and so, and I did a really beautiful job. So I was really hesitant to tear it out again, but I wanted to restore it to the original space. I'd matched the baseboard. I mean, it wasn't anything like really, it was just a bevel cut on a, you know, but it, I matched sure. it to the existing and nice. it was tight. Yeah, I was really proud of it. The drywall job was good. You know. Great. <laughs> Um, the person that was working with me was very meticulous. I probably would have, you know, good enough, but right. <laughs> so I, I can't take all the credit there either, but, but I'd kind of kept putting that off. And then at some point I knew I had a hunch that underneath the kitchen linoleum was an original beautiful floor, but I knew if I pulled that linoleum back, there could be a number of things. There could be a lot of glue and gunk. Yep. There could be really, uh, really crappy chunks of floor. Right. And um, I finally decided to heck with it one day, one night. And uh, it turns out that it was a, a, a rubber floor. Luckily, with every four feet, there were some adhesive strips. Anyway, within 24 hours, I'd pulled this flooring back and had this maple floor. It had some gaps. I mean, it, I could see where somebody's like, we need to get a new. Maybe it was to sell the house. I don't really know what the, or they had a young kid. Um, whatever the reasoning was. To cover it, you mean? They covered and, res- yeah. and preserved this beautiful floor for me. <laughs> wow. Without messing it up. Wow. And within 24 hours, I had transformed my kitchen. Wow. It was amazing. <laughs> that led me, That then of course, you know, my art's packed away and, and now I was just on fire. So next <laughs> I focused on the, the, the mudroom porch because I had a hunch that underneath the uh, drywall, there was the original brick of the, of the house on the interior wall. And that I also had a hunch that underneath the drywall on the ceiling was some kind of beadboard. What? And underneath the floor, maybe there'd been, sure enough, it was all original. Wow. Um, gray enamel next is sandblasting. So I'm going to be, you know, it's kind of a form of a brush, but I've got to sure. clean it up. And so within a week, and then, and then I also ripped out, I reopened a doorway. That's where I started was ripping open. So there used to be a separate <laughs> entrance into the second floor from okay. that porch. Yeah. And I knew that was there. I was yeah. like, this used to be a separate entrance because the second floor was its own apartment. And they'd closed that off and, and opened it up into the first floor of the house. So I just went on a bender for a week of just like deconstructing basically all this, undoing this work that the previous guy had done. And he'd done it in a way that luckily it was came apart pretty clean. There was an air nailer involved somewhere, but I have this sawzall that I've had, an incredible tool. Yeah. Um, I busted that out. And I did remove that wall, which led me just last week to paint it. And um, I often don't do color on ceilings, but it does kind of remind me of like the old days of Grandma's Kitchen had this weird ill green enamel up and over the ceiling, you know. <laughs> Or, or um, and uh, I did this rose color, and it's got um, slanted roofs and 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 um, um, Mansfort windows, which are kind of these dormers that stick out. Oh, sure. So there's a really interesting rhythm to the the windows up there. By opening this room up again, it really brought that to life. And uh, so I did kind of like got out the big brush and a couple colors, and I do decorative painting work that way. And then I did some glazes over that because I've been working with glazes. So the interesting part with my uh, the decorative painting is that painting canvases on a smaller scale sped up my painting on a larger scale. Interesting. Because it made me... It gave me a certain amount of confidence, and also I was playing with um, transparency in colors. Right. 
And instead of doing a second coat, something I found with eggshell paint is that the first coat will go on real smooth and I get these blends. And the second coat, there almost becomes this tooth that drags the paint and it sets quicker and it's different. And so the fluidity and the movement I get on that first coat, I often don't regain that on the second coat. And so um, I learned how to just like polish without doing a full-on second coat which often led to some kind of struggle with me. Right. Interesting. Yeah. And uh, again, we're dealing in scale. So when I'm painting a canvas, I'm dealing with a a smaller brush. When I'm painting a room, I'm dealing with a bigger brush. Right. Um, And at different parts of my body. And this is where that uh, Bujinkan training came in. Wow. And the sword work came in. Wow. Of knowing how to to root in your hips and how to move. Right. Um, And theater painting, too. Right. That's where the big brush on a stick was. All, sure. It's all theater. It's all scale. So in theater, you're working with a, a designer gives you a, a rendering. This is what I want it to look like. And you're looking at it in half inch scale. And how do I, you know, so Translate he used it. a little brush and I got to use a big brush, right? Right. You're dealing in scale. So, uh, yeah, that's been a kind of a, it's just, again, I guess it kind of comes back to that same idea of the sword being your brush. It's all the same. It's all scale. Get small, get big. I'm just a big kid. You know, that's the happy place, right? There's a joy. I'm yeah. still a kid inside, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So there it is. Cool. Yeah. Well, let's take a break and we'll be back with John Tully on In the Act. Welcome back to Mead Mead Community Community Radio. This is Erica on In the Act with John Tully. Welcome back, John. Thanks, Erica. Good to be here. Yay. This has been a really awesome conversation to have with you. Um, I, um, I love to hear about the... How, how creativity is translated differently for you yeah. in different spaces, and um, both in observation and reflection and in the act of, of creating as well, whether it's like on your canvas, which are what, 16 by 20s, 20 by 24? Way too many different that. sizes. Unfortunately, I never settle on one size. I love yeah. working big, but they take up a lot of room. And Right. So, yeah. Would that be your preferred size? A larger um, space, larger canvas. I've been larger... do, actually I've, the 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 lake series I've been doing is I think are two by three or maybe eighteen by twenty. Two feet by three feet. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So I like working big, but yeah, I I, I also just, I started getting small again, or it just depends. I mean, I get for I have way too many sizes. Sure. So, well, talking about like just touching back on those paintings. Uh huh. Um, do you? How many do you have? How many of how that many of the, series? Yeah, of that series. Probably 20. Okay. Uh, maybe more because I did do a number of smaller ones. But at one point I just, um, something else. Okay, here's another thing, you know. Um, sure. That I was playing with was um, sometimes in that same spirit of my daughter or this same spirit of like getting something down and moving. And, and, and to, to like quit thinking or overthinking or, you know, just to, to take a step, um, I'll just throw some lines onto a, a, a canvas. Very random. Sometimes maybe circular. A lot of times I guess I'm, I'm thinking of um, floral things. And that was kind of the interesting part of getting horizontal or getting a, a, a horizon line that, that, that breaks the edge of the canvas and just goes on for however long. Sure. But often I'm, uh, you know, I'm trying to like, put a circle on a square basically, you know, and I'll, I'll, or I'll get small into a rose or get small into a circle or, or a nucleus or a embryo or whatever it is. Um, so I started playing with um, using charcoal and then basically what is happening is that I'm getting this pigment on my canvas that as I'm filling in and uh, this is probably comes out of theater of, of, of uh, getting as much movement 
and a sense of light on that f- infill as I'm filling the space. So where, whereas when uh, there's times if, if I had used a pencil line, that pencil line, you can kind of paint over it or ignore it. Um, but it's also a, a point to maybe change the tone or the intensity of a color or, you know, like a coloring book or there's a line. Right? Sure. Um, but with the charcoal, suddenly I'm able to pick up that tone of the, of the dust, charcoal dust and it, it's blending, and I'm, I was using white, and I was basically starting to create this um, sense of light and structure through that, through filling that canvas, much like my daughter did as a kid. Right. You know? So here I am. I'm, I, I was throwing down charcoal, and then, um, and I was getting this tonal play. That then I and then I picked up some. Actually, it was at Lakeside Art Supply. I picked Lakeshore up Lakeshore Art uh, Supply. Lakeshore, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the golden glaze material. And I've worked with glazes in the theater and I've certainly worked with thinning my paints with water and then finding out that they'll lift up because there's no binder there, right? Right, which doesn't happen with golden, by the way. Well, and that's the, yeah. So basically <laughs> I've added this, um, again, I started, I, I, I upped my game. When I first started painting, I was eating up materials and I was using cheap paints and I was using cheap materials and cheap brushes. And then right. my, my kids were going to art or going to college in Galesburg, Illinois. And suddenly I realized Dick Blick is down here. Right. Oh my God, there's a closeout section. Oh my God. <laughs> and I started, you know, cause I'm a cheapskate. I started buying closeout, better quality materials. And then suddenly realizing the impact that that had huge of, of bam, making that statement. I want red. Boom. That's red. Right. You know, or I want to it's not fill her with chalk. Yep. Right. Yep. Um, so I had been shifting into better quality materials. I had to go through that phase, you know, and I encourage people to do that is, is just take whatever it is, you know, what is it what, that you can afford and work with it? Um, the tool has to be right for you. Yeah. Right. Whether it's cheap product right. and inexpensive or found objects right. or or the expensive, right. sure. Yeah. And so I found um, I had come across these incredible brushes, these kind of real firm acrylic brushes. And, and I'm fairly, um, I push, I'm physical as a painter. I'm really, I need something that's going to give me some resistance. Sure. Uh, I, I was able to paint on linen, which is incredible as a surface because wow. it, it's got, um, I, I found some in clothes out. I haven't been able to revisit that, but you know, it has this kind of tooth to it. That's very, very different. Um, and then glazes. So, uh, I was playing these, 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 um, color play over these tonal structures. And then eventually I thought about, well, what if I laid in with chalk with, with colored dry pastel? Okay. And again, I went to our local arts store and it took a while looking around a while. I was like, this is exactly what I need, you know, and, and I did do some that way. But um, so the, that series back to that, I think your original question, whenever, however long ago was. That's fine. I started by, um, I just started using, measuring down and, and getting the exact halfway point so these could s- s- be all together in a row and it would be the same horizon line. Right. And they could be flipped potentially. Okay. Um Probably a little different than a photo because a photo is like, well, that, obviously that's water. Oh, but sure. But these are not so obvious because there's a it's a movement thing. Um, and I just lined up and I just kind of mass produced, but they all ended up taking on a different characteristic because they're all individuals, right? Right. But I would just, while I was waiting, because often because I'm working really fast, I'm not giving things a chance to set up. And what I discovered is that for me, for my purposes, an extender is better than a glaze because a glaze is going to retain that open time. And I'm needing to move faster. And so I started playing with the extender, which is going to give me the transparency, but it's also going to set up like the acrylic paint will set up. Does that make sense? sure. Whereas a glaze is kind of meant to have a bit more of an open time so you can kind of work it. Almost closer to like, not an oil, but that sort of process. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, yeah. And certainly that's true on walls. Um, You know, a glaze is going to have a a long, slightly longer open time. Golden makes that open acrylic too, which I played with. Um, Again, I got some red tagged and that was a really fun. That actually is where I think I started this idea is as I would, I found this beautiful tub of purple open and I would lay in lines with that and then do that same kind of thing where I would be picking up that pigment and um, it almost has this stained that glass quality to it because I'm maintaining that original line but it's kind of bleeding into the brush strokes and, it's, and I'm blending. Interesting. But it's almost like having this, laying out this reserve of, oh, I need a little more of that 
I'll dip into it right. as I'm going. So right. it's more wet though when it, you're okay. Yeah. Well, so I was I was confused because I thought extender was to I guess I was confused about that. So you're you were actually the 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 material you want it to be a little bit looser or wet so that you can um, be more fluid with different color usage, different properties. I've, I've come to a place of lately, and especially with this this water series or this this horizon line, is using color washes or using transparent layers of color. Okay. And the issue I was having was color lifting if I get it wet. And, and, and a lot of that came down to not. And so, again, you know, that's the beauty of checking in with local artists and in our right. supply stores. Like, I'm right. needing this. I'm having this issue. Right. Um, another friend of mine would, would actually use, uh, uh, I guess it's a varnish, you know, you, uh, to actually lock your color in. Sure. And then suddenly you're able, and everything, it's a lot, a lot like the problem I was talking about earlier about a second coat where things are grabbing, whereas it yeah. would actually, your brush flows when you've locked everything in. Right. And you're not lifting anything. I so, see what you're talking yeah. about. Thanks for explaining yeah, that. Yeah. I get it now. Yeah. I'm on board. Yeah. So the extender, I just discovered that, you know, and again, it was just, the glaze was kind of like an introductory. I was familiar with glazing. Um but it seemed like the extender was the thing that I was really needing, which is just basically you're adding more glue to your paint and also sure. creating a transparent a transparency as well. Right. And a little water for fluidity. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's um, that created a change because for the most part, I would work wet and opaque very fast. I see. But it would be layers. So, so the paintings themselves don't have as much weight. Right. As as the last four or five years, I mean, a lot of what I was doing was much more opaque and uh, heavier. Interesting. And so these took on this, not only am I establishing some movement and some tonal play early on, that's very subtle, uh -huh. but then also everything about it is subtle, I guess, compared with what I'd been doing, because there's washes involved that um, let that sense of light breathe still sure from that initial thing and if anything what i've found is on some of the ones that don't work as well as i've overworked them i've uh, gone i've gone too far right you know isn't that <laughs> classic <you know? laughs> i make steaks <laughs> right right right, right. <laughs> well i mean an interesting to um i was trying to think of um what processes i'm using um or techniques or materials i'm using and how they've changed with where I'm at in my life. Mm -hmm. Like how are they analogies in some ways to where you're at. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like the talking, um, the visiting the lake, the fog, the layers, the memory layers, the um, peeling back of old things to refresh and create new, those glazes right? Um, that transparency. I don't know. Those are the things that, those are the words and the, the things that kind of rose up for me while you were talking. Well, it's interesting because as I'm thinking about where I am at my life and um, the sort of trauma that any of us carry, and at some point, hopefully we face and shed, I can see a lot of, you know, a lot of what I've been doing here, moving to a new place away from where I'd been for almost, you know, two and a half decades raising kids. Uh, right. Wow. To, to step away from that and kind of reinvent myself. I mean, there's an element of the emperor has no clothes, you know, I mean, there's an element of, of standing forth and being my truest self that I can be. Right. Um, my kids are healthy Moving on, um, my, my father's passed on, uh, experienced that, but then I'm also within that transition, I've also been able to get to know my mother in ways that I wouldn't have. And that's been yeah. beautiful, you know, and, and yeah. the pandemic has brought me to a place of being in constant contact with her that I wouldn't have had, you know, there's, so there's a lot of really good things that have come out right. of not only making this move, but then to have this pandemic four, five months after we, I made this move right. to something, okay, you Five get, months after, wow. Yeah. You want to get down to the nitty gritty and figure some stuff out here. 
You know, why don't you spend you know, four months in your house? <laughs> right, draw your sword now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I hope you, you're getting good and sharp. So, yeah. No, wow. uh, that's an, thanks for bringing that up because it, it made me think about the opacity of, of, of what I've been doing and, and the, 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 what am I, you know, and this to kind of like become untangled to the sure. point where it's one line right. level. Yeah. And that's one of the things in my photos that I'm a real stickler about. And luckily there's these crazy apps where you can straighten it. And I'm, right. I straighten my horizon line and I can tell if it's a little bit off. Sure but you it's can. like this thing that I do. It's like, it's got to be level. Yeah. You know, I just, it just brings me sanity. Um, yeah. So. I love it. Yeah. I love that. That's great. Yeah. Well, we're coming to the end, towards the end of our right. show. Um, is there anything... Is there anything, well, let me, let me ask this first. Where do you see a path forward from here? Like, do you have an idea or a hope of where you want to go to or what, what Art, you see happening or artistically, literally, or globally or whatever, whatever. comes to yeah. mind? Um, it's interesting. Cause I don't really know. Uh, yeah. I, I, see, I have, I have incredible hope and there's a lot of possibility. I think I wasn't really sure you know, a new community and then everything shuts down. Where, where are my people? How do I fit in here? Sure. Um, you know, look, look, look to thyself, you know, and, and, uh, to just kind of like hang up the art stuff for a, a moment and realize that it's, it's always there. Um, yeah. the, so there's been so much, um, validation for where I am and, and, and I've really kind of, you know, even just going at the house where I'm like, part of me is like, what do I do? Do I sell this? Move on? Go, you know, but where? You know, and, and right. so to kind of like roll up my sleeves and kind of whack at that, there's just a lot of validation f- for all of this. And so I appreciate the, the opportunity. And I think this is going to be a great show, you know, with just what you got going here. Because hopefully somebody would take something of what I have to say, and I'm looking forward to hear other people's takes on it, right? I mean, and I think that's what it's about, is it is an opportunity to listen and to speak on these things and and ask these questions. So I don't know, I got, I I did get asked to hang some work, and so I've got to revisit these. I didn't really share many of these with anybody on, on, uh, I don't think, on my social media platform or anything, (laughs) because I was just going through my thing, you know? Right. So I'm kind of looking forward to bringing them out I don't have the exact dates, but uh, Honey and Ace is going to maybe be hanging there for three months or something. Fantastic! So just found that out yesterday. Oh, I love that. That's so great. It is great. Yeah. So it's it's it gets now it gets me back to that place of okay, let's finish these up. Sure. Let's yep. present these. Great. Um. So yeah, that's where it's at. Well, and it's that you know go back to the lake. It's that ebb and flow. Mm-hmm. It's the tide. It's those waves. Like sometimes, what did you say that there was some shadow underneath and there's an angle on a wave or there's that, there's that meditative finding the pace of your life and yeah. that, that pattern and play yeah. and uh, experimentation and, and being present. I kept I kept killing my flip phone. I had a flip phone for a while, and I'd get too too into <laughs> like the recently, lake. like yeah, like within six months. Seven I months love that. Last, That's last great. summer. I had a flip phone. Excellent. And I killed it from love trying this. to get up close with the lake. And so then I I bought a <laughs> underwater camera, really cheap one, which had its limitations. But so then there I was in the in the shallows of Lake Michigan, and she's just pounding me, <laughs> and I'm down there <laughs> giggling like a kid. So you know, yeah. Um, and everybody's walking up on the paths, and there's this guy down, and, <laughs> and to feel the power of that. But yeah, I mean, yeah. absolutely, the lake. I mean, there's this these these moments of serenity, and there's moments of like I could eat you alive. I mean, she's not right. to be messed with, right? But um, there's so many answers there, really, and that's what's been f- fascinating to me is to go down and 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 to really find the almost to like to hear them by coming home and, and editing some of these photos has been a really amazing process so that's just my here and now so um I yeah it's really that. exciting it's really exciting time to be thank so. you so much john yeah, you're welcome and thank you <laughs> <laughs> that's our pinball yeah. timer um but thank you for uh your instrumental in creating mead community radio and we so appreciate all that you do and all that you are thank you. here. And thank you so much for sharing just the meandering wanderings of 
creative flow that's in your life. And um, it's really important. So uh, thanks so much for being on In the Act, Thank John you. Tully. It's really a pleasure to be here. Thanks. In the Act is produced in the studios at Mead Public Library in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. More information on the web at meadpl.org.